First and, former, for, first and foremost, I'd like for everybody to stand, if they would. If you're able to, raise your arms up, and let's just give God some praise this morning. It's just been a wonderful service. Amen. Lord, we just thank you. Lord, we thank you for what you've done, Lord. We just praise you this morning, Lord, for the start of the service. And we thank you for everything that you've done in everybody's lives here, Lord. And Lord, I just pray that you continue to work with us and help us to get stronger and closer to you. These things we ask in your name. Amen. Now, y'all bear with me this morning because it's going to be... Uh, it's, it's going to, God's got something for us this morning, and uh, just pray that we all receive it the way it's intended, and we're going to start off in the book of Acts, chapter 16, verse 16. Let me get my glasses here. <clears throat> Acts 16, verse 16, it says, Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with the spirit of divination met us, who brought, us, who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and, and us and cried out, saying, These men are the servants of God, of the Most High God, who proclaimed to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to this spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. But when her master saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities, and they brought them to the magistrates and said, These men, being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city, and they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or observe. Then the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many straps on them, they threw them in the prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Verse 25, But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of, to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, and so that the found, foundations of the prisons were shaken. And immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awakening from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prison, prisoners had fled, drew his sword, and was about to kill himself. But Paul cried out, called with a loud voice, saying, Do not do, do yourself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light, ran in, fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, believe on me, the Lord, Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved in your household. Then they spoke to the word of the Lord to him and all were in, who were in his house. And they took them the same hour of night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and all of his family were baptized. Now when he brought them to his home house, he set food before them. He rejoiced having believed in God with all his household. Let us pray. Dear God, we just thank you for the, the, the opportunity to be here at New Holland today, Lord. I thank you for all the blessings you've done here in this church over the last several years. And Lord, I just pray that you just continue to work. Lord, use this word, um, not my words, but your word. And that if someone here today may not know you, that they may be touched by your words and they'd come to know you today, Lord. I just pray your blessings on this church and just continue to use it for your glory. 
Amen. Now, over the last year, um, it's funny because actually, April 14th, 2023 is when I wound up, but that's when I was transferred from Northside Hospital uh, Cancer, or Northside Forsyth. I was transferred to Northside Cancer. I found out on the, uh, the 12th, I guess I was in, we were in the hospital, I got put in the hospital on the 10th at Northside coming. I was there for a couple of days, and that's when, of course, when I was, went in, I went in for a sore throat because Easter last year was last week, a, a week ago, exactly. And I was supposed to help with a sermon, and, but I had a, thought I had strep throat. So we went in on Monday morning to the doctor and said, you know, nothing's clearing up, nothing's clearing up. Uh, what would you have us to do? Because we've been, prior to, I'd been sick, I'd had all these things going on, just little medical issues. And it was, um, nothing was ever getting any better. So we, um, they said, well, you got two choices. Do another round of antibiotics, which I'd already been on like six or eight rounds since November of antibiotics, trying to clear up things. And then, um, or you can go to the emergency room. They have a, a, a doc, ENT doctor there on staff, and they can he can take a look at your throat, and if it needs to be lanced or whatever, they can do that there. So I said, okay. So I called Tina. She was at work, and I said, uh, the doctor's recommended me just go to the emergency room. You know, I'll call you when I get done, and I'll let you know, or we, maybe we go have lunch or something because it was early in the morning. Anyway, um, we head out. I go over there and wait for a long time. Of course, it, you know, go to the emergency room anywhere, it's, it's a long wait. And um, we, uh, they draw a ton of blood. They draw like 30 vials of blood or something, you know, whenever they, because there's nothing that's really pointing to anything. And sit there, sit there, sit there in the emergency room finally. And finally about four o'clock or so, two doctors came in, there was one, um, um, sometimes my memory escapes me, uh, internal medicine, and the other is infectious disease doctor. And they said, we're going to keep you for a night or two. Got something going on. We don't know what yet, but we're going to keep you for a night or two. And I said, okay. So I called Tina at that time and said, oh, they're going to keep me for a night or two. And so um, she said, okay. So I don't think nothing about it. You know, I don't... Um, I just think I've got something. Something's just got me sick. I just can't get over it. Uh, then that was on Monday. Tuesday evening, um, a little nurse comes in, and I see on her thing it says on oncology. And she said, uh, Tina was there, of course, and you know she said uh, she's very young, uh, PA for in, in, in oncology, and she said. Uh, you know, she started talking about uh, cancer, and we said, "What? You know, what are you what are you talking about?" I was just came in with a sore throat, and now you're talking about cancer. And you know, in that moment, of course, I had my uh, fears, and Tina did as well. Throughout this whole thing, uh, pardon me for a minute. Yeah, we had our fears. Once that, once the C word comes out, anybody that's ever been faced with it, they know what that is. They know how scary that is. Or anything that you're not expecting that comes out, you know, that's, it, it's just terrifying. And, and it was, it was, it was really terrifying to an extent. To me, now, I can't speak for Tina. Uh, I know I know it was to her, but to me, okay, I got cancer. What's next? And she said, well, there, we don't know exactly what it is yet, but they'll, there should have already been somebody come in to talk to you. They'll be in later. And was it later that night or was it later that night an older 
physician came in and she said, you got leukemia and you need to go on long, you need to contact your work, go on short term disability. Told Tina she needs to do file for the FMLA stuff and things just started moving really fast. And she said, we're going to transfer you down to Atlanta to the cancer center. And so we did. And she said, it may be two hours, it may be three days, four days, whatever, but just be ready to go. And Tina said, we can't just drive there <laughs> and get there tonight. And she said, no, you have to be transported. So anyway, Friday morning, transport, we, we leave Northside Cancer or Northside Forsyth at 6 a.m., which is today, a year ago, because of leap year. And when we get there, You know God's in control of everything, okay? We all know that. We, 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 say, we say that, that we know that. But, you know, I had a calmness about everything. And like I told my kids when I finally told them on Thursday before we got transferred on Friday, that what was going on. And my son said, well, I knew you didn't just have the strep throat, Daddy. <laughs> they wouldn't have kept you in the hospital for all this time. But anyway... You know, they took it as they could and did very well with it. But when, uh, when we got to the hospital down there uh, at Northside Cancer, which uh, if Larry and Cheryl's here, I know they're very familiar with it. Uh, but uh, they have a floor just dedicated to leukemia. And they told us that, you know, we're going to do, when we got there, we got there like it's, 7 30 8 o'clock because the the transport took us down and we went down and we got there in the room and the nurse said okay we've got this 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 is planned and we um we're going to do this at this time and we got to get a move on this because this is pretty serious uh the the type of cancer i has it or the, uh, that i have is uh acute myeloid leukemia and it, it, it can move pretty fast on things. And there's not a, uh, depending on how far along it is, that leads to it as well. So anyway, they do all those tests and finally about noon I can have some breakfast. <laughs> and uh, you know, I'm starving to death because I'm a pretty big fella. Uh, not as big now as I was then, but uh, you know, uh, they finally get where we can have something to eat. And but all day long on that on that Friday, we we're just you know just doing one test after the other, um, and then finally Saturday it was kind of it was less and but they came back and said you know you've got acute myeloid leukemia, we're just waiting on the breakdown of it, and I forget exactly it's trisomy eight or something like that uh, the the blood the blood cells weren't maturing. My white blood cells weren't maturing. I was producing, but they just weren't. They were they were leaving home before they were supposed to. Uh, they weren't able to do what they were supposed to do. <coughs> so anyway, uh, we go along the the uh, the uh, chemotherapy. You know, that's what they decide is going to be the treatment right now, and then then we're going to do the. Uh, stem cell transplant down the road. But first, we got to get this stopped. So, you know, that's, I think, Rick, you came over when I was coming uh, uh, before everything got so uh, bad. And then uh, uh, Brian came down to uh, um, the Cancer Institute. But anyway, all this time, you know, you got all the stuff with the insurance going on. And I'm just, you know, everybody says, you got to think about yourself. You got to think about yourself. I've never been one to think about myself. I'm always trying to think about how to do something for somebody else. You know, being raised the way I was, you know, we weren't, you know, you always look at your, you look at your family and you do things that your family needs you to do. Nobody ever tells you how to receive those things. And, because, you know, the man's supposed to be the provider. He's supposed to be the one looking after everything, managing everything. And I've never been able to do that. Thankfully, my wife 
dance, she does those things. But, you know, everybody keeps telling me, you know, you, you got to look after you. Well, you know, somebody's got to look after my wife. And, you know, with you guys and family backing us, we were able to come through it. Because I know that all the prayers that were lifted up for us, uh, things could not have happened in a better way than they did if God hadn't been involved with it. And if you guys had not been behind us. Because every time it seemed like there was a roadblock thrown up, thrown up uh, there was something good that came from it. Uh, you know, even little things, you know, uh, when they told us we were going to do the stem cell transplant and we had to change hospitals right in the middle of everything. We had to change hospitals uh, that we were using, not while I was in the hospital, it was this kind of June-ish, but we uh, had to go from using Northside to using Emory. And, you know, you like who you start with. You know, they were the best in our mind, they were the best ones to be able to handle this because they knew everything from the beginning. And I did, I was really blessed by God that the doctor that was handling my case was the top doctor, the leading researcher at Northside for leukemia BMT floor. His name is Dr. Hammond. Great doctor. Isn't that right, honey? Dr. Hammond. I forget. And then we, but when we, and we, we knew that, uh, you know, are we going to get that same top care when we go to Emory? And we go to Emory and the oncologist and um, hematologist that we received is Dr. Frank and Dr. Uh, Langston. And they are the top two at Emory. So God's working. He's, got me the best doctors they are without me knowing anything about those things. And I was able to overcome all the things that was put forward by listening to what they said and listening to God. And I'm, you know, I'm, I fully believe, you know, that, um, you know, the listening to the doctors, you know, people, you know, believe the science, believe the science. Well, it's not the science, it's that God's in control of the science. And that He is the one that has put these people in these places for this particular time in your life, and those people are the ones who are watching over you through God, you know, for God. Whether they're believers or not, but I, I tell you, one of the things that was so comforting to me when was at Northside and at Emory, was that the, the staff, not just the, not the doctors so much, but the, the nurses and the, and the floor, and the housekeeping the folks and everybody, everybody was asking about prayer. They were asking if they could pray for us. We didn't have to ask them. We had this uh, one beautiful little nurse or housekeeping attended, whatever they're called. <sighs> such a wonderful lady, such a wonderful spirit about her. And I had met her one day. Uh, Tina had left early to go home for, for a night. And when she came back, I, well, I had met this lady that evening. And then when Tina came back, she was standing outside of the, this one was at Northside. And at Northside, there was a, uh, I didn't see it personally. But Tina was telling me that there was a uh, like a little courtyard, and it had the the verse on the wall. There's a stone in the ground, and she said, it, and on the stone, it said, "Be still and know that I'm a God, that I am God." And you know, Tina, uh, she was very strong, but she had a tough time with dealing with everything. Not because of her faith, it's just because that's the way she is. Uh, she never showed me, but I knew. But this little young lady came up 
And she said, and Tina was standing there and she stood behind Tina and she said, be still. And then she said it again and Tina turned around and she said, be still and know that he's here. No matter what you're going through, he's there. Just like with Paul and Silas here. You know, this is one of the, if not the, my, if it's not my favorite, it's one of the favorite because I can imagine Paul and Silas sitting in jail, been beaten, taken all the way down to zero, as my, as my blood count was, taken all the way to zero, and not able to do anything for myself. They weren't able to do anything for themselves. And I'm having to rely on everybody to, to stay clean, to stay healthy, so that I don't get sick and I don't, you know, get worse than what I'm already at. And I still have to do that today because I'm still not 100% because I hadn't had my vaccine and stuff. So, you know, now I worry about measles and everything now. But, you know, God's watching over everything. And I know that. But knowing that all these little things that he's got in, you know, that he's, he knows that I'm going to have to go all the way to zero on my blood count and know that I'm going to be very sick and knowing that the least little thing can set me back reminds me of them being there. They're beaten to zero. They're, they're just, they're just, they're in the middle of the, of the, of the, of the, uh, Jail. It says they're in the inner, innermost part of the jail. I, I don't remember exactly what it says, but they're in the middle of the jail. They're not even where you see daylight. And they're in the middle of the jail where nothing can happen. And what are they doing? They're singing praise to God. And, you know, we, it's easy for us to, you know, there's an old song, God on the Mountain by the McCamies. I don't know if anybody in here is old enough to remember that. <laughs> song or not, but God on the mountain, you know, it talks about, you know, everything's good when you're up on top, but, when, you know, when you're in the valley, you know, that's when you start questioning where God's at, you know, you've been with me on top, but where are you now? He's in the same spot. You just flipped it, you just flipped it, because a valley, if you invert it, is a mountaintop. So, if you, you know, we were, we, I didn't look at it as being in a valley. I looked at it as being on top because God was, I was closer to God, I guess, than I've ever been in a long time. You know, and I just, what could I do? There was nothing else to do. Just like with Paul and Silas, there was nothing else to do but pray and worship God. And, you know, in today's world, you know, there's, there's so many things that are out there for the younger folks and everything that are distraction. And what, have, have they reached their lowest point yet? You know, people, we want everybody saved. We don't want anybody to go to hell that we know. I don't know of anybody sitting here this morning that wants a loved one to go to hell. I, I, I just can't imagine that. And are we praying for that person by name? Are we doing these things that God has asked us to do? Are we letting Him do the work? You know, a couple of verses later after that, you know, I think about them singing, and I bet they're, you know, in my mind, uh, they sang Amazing Grace. Not my chains are gone, just Amazing Grace. And then they sang, and when the chains broke, they sang Victory in Jesus. That, but it needs to, that's one song that I love to death, but I wish it had one more verse. Because <laughs> it, it's worthy, it's a worthy of a four course, four verse song. And then the last song we sang, Mark, I just, what was the last song we sang? What a beautiful name. When the, when the jailer got up and ran in, that's what they were singing. Because he had delivered them through air, through the stuff that was uh, everything that they had been through, and he delivered them through those things. And he can do those same things for us today. He can deliver us through the hard times, 
Uh, I know, been there, still doing it. But, you know, there's, he's such, he is such a wonderful name. And I'm so happy that my family's here today. And I know that, you know, I know that they're saved. And I know that, you know, all my loved ones are saved. I said my family, but y'all know my aunt Shirley. I don't know how many of you knew she was my aunt, but my aunt Shirley is here. Of course, Mr. and Miss Crow is here, their family. But uh, Aunt Shirley is my daddy's sister, and uh, she is the uh, she's not the oldest by any means, but she's not the youngest by any means. <laughs> uh, when I was little, uh, I used to call her the little, the old blue-haired lady because she. <laughs> so y'all have something that y'all can tease her about now. But for years, you know, it's funny. For years, we, uh, when we were uh, going here, uh, before we went to left and went somewhere else for a little while, I tried to get Shirley to come, and I think it was the Sunday after we left, she started coming here, and I said, "What? Well, you couldn't come when I was there. You can only come once I leave." But anyway, uh, I want to thank y'all for listening to me ramble. It's, uh, but, you know, talking about God, there's so many things. I mean, I was sitting here and listening to the music this morning, and every song I said, God, how did, how did Mark know that? How did he know that? How did he know that? Because everyone unfit to me with what I was feeling in my heart, and I have so many things in my heart that I want to share that I just can't, if we did, uh, we'd be here till uh, two o'clock, and the Methodists and the Holiness and everybody would beat us to the lunch, and you know it'd be crowded for us. But you know, I love you guys, and I love this church, and I love God more than anything. That's that's the most important thing to me, and I love my wife secondly, and then my children and grandchildren. They're so wonderful uh, grandkids. If you not had any hurry up. 